Yumoja, Unity. Welcome to Black Dot Cultural Center's third annual Kwanzaa celebration. Today's show will feature two of our esteemed African Center scholars. As MC tonight will be Baba Oshi, and our guest lecturer will be Baba Mwalimu Baruti. You can find any of Baba Baruti's books at Black D O T cc.com that's black dot cc.com also in the store at 6984 main street in lathonia georgia if you feel the need if your spirit leads you to make a donation for this celebration you can always cash app us at dollar signs black dot books b-o-o-k-s peace family Enjoy the celebration. I'm here to tell you the story. But before I tell you the story, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to envision what I'm about to tell you. The name of this story is the fable city of Pali. That's P-A-L-I. There was this travel. He traveled all over the world looking for a place to call home. But everywhere that travel went, he saw nothing but destruction, despair, hopelessness, helplessness, and homelessness. Traveling, kept traveling. And while traveling through West Africa, he came across this city named Polly. Named Polly. And travel walked back and forth and to and fro, not believing what he was seeing. He had never seen anything like this before, never experienced it. So he saw this elder. And he ran up on the elder and he said, Elder, elder. Help me, please. I think I'm suffering from heat stroke or delusions. Elder said, hold up, son. What's wrong? He said, Elder, I traveled all over the world. And I've never seen streets so clean. I've never seen all these mansions. All the children walking around in their finest kente cloth. I can't believe what I'm seeing, Elder. I'm making a plea to my community. I'm talking about black, black and black, black, black. While we're having that conversation with you, the, the priest, the priestess, they sit back watching you. They want to know what your energy is, what your spirit is. Then we all get together and we have a conversation about you. Whether or not we want to invite you into our city. And if, if we decide that we want to invite you to our city, we throw this huge celebration. And son, at this celebration, everyone brings you one brick and 
one dollar. So the traveler looked at the elder and he said, Elder, how many people are in this city? The elder said, Son, we got 100,000 people. And with this 100,000 people, we're able to take these 100,000 bricks and we're able to build your mansion. Once that mansion is built, son, you're able to start your life off in Polly with a hundred thousand mm. dollars. Look at that. Now, the moral of this story: we're out here looking for complicated solutions for seemingly complicated problems, and it's quite simple. One brick, one dollar. One brick and one dollar will be built families, communities, and nations. Do you see it? Can you visualize it? Now go manifest it. Turning Harriet Tutton and so many others, so many others. We pour this libation in their memory and in their honor. Is that shame? I say. We pour this libation to those unborn, those young men and women who will once again lead us back on the stage of human history as free and proud and productive people. We say, Ashe. Ashe. At this time, I want you to call out the names of ancestors. First, let's call the names of those who are inspirational, those who are famous, those who inspired you, those who motivated you. Then we'll call out the names of your family members because they were equally as important. They may have done something for you, guided you, told you, helped you. So, because by calling out their name, you keep their memory and their spirit alive. So at this time, Let's call out the names of those who you feel. Give me the names. Call the names. Say 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 the names. All right. Now, let's call out the names of those family members. Uncle June, but little Willie. You know? Yeah. Ain't you to make. Let's call out their names who are really inspirational in your life. Because once again, because by calling their names, we keep their memory and their spirit alive. Call their names. Robert Lee Small, Ruby Wright. L. Perry McNeil. Ashe, Ashe. We pour this libation to the spirit of Kwanzaa. Let the spirit of Kwanzaa abide in us 24 7, 365. After this libation, I'm going to say a few words about Kwanzaa and the importance of Kwanzaa. You know, because I know that uh, 55 years of Kwanzaa's existence, there's still a lot of us who don't grasp it, who don't understand it, you know, thinks it's a substitute for this or that, but we'll talk about it. So, we're going to pour this libation to the spirit of Kwanzaa, the seven principles, the seven symbols, all that it entails to motivate, inspire, and guide us. Not just from December 26th to January 1st, but every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. We pour this libation to the spirit of Kwanzaa. Brothers and sisters, let us all say, Ashe. 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 I say, 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 I and, and he based that on the harvest principles. But 
It belongs to us as African people. And unfortunately, because we are here, we have not embraced it as we should. Because within the Kwanzaa principles, if we would, it is liberation. Within the Kwanzaa principles, it is an actualization that is profound and deep. It is our brothers and sisters, and we should control Kwanzaa. We should have many Kwanzas, even outside of December 26th to January 1st, because we need to promote that idea within our people. You ready for that? Yes. Okay. So brothers and sisters, I, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. And uh, so we have some entertainment, that's good. You know, uh, this, this Zoom concept, you know, considering what's going on, you know, I, I was part of the Pan-African Federalist Movement and we had a conference back in October and we had 80 some people on, on the Zoom around the world, you know, trying to establish Africa for Africans and a independent African, African states, you know, within the next 20, within the next 10 years, you know. And so that was a beautiful thing. And, I, and, and other concepts like that. So I appreciate this time. Um, once again, brothers and sisters, let us put those sponsored principles. Let me, let me wrap up with this. Let me wrap up with this. It's not going to be long. How can we put the Kwanzaa principles in our everyday lives? You know, there is a, um, um, there is a, a thing about the number 13 in this society. The, third, the number 13 in this society is a bad number. In their society. Exactly. Exactly. In theirs. And that's how they promote it. But, of course, they understand it because they co-opted the knowledge that we once possessed. So they know it. In fact, how many colonies did the Europeans establish here? 13. 13. Why 13? Why not 12? Why not 15? Those are good numbers. Why 13? You know why? Because the number 13 is the number of transformation. 12 completes the cycle. 13 begins anew. Mm. How many signs in the zodiac? 12, 12 plus the sun, 13. How many disciples did Jesus have? 12 plus Jesus, 13. How many mythical nights at the round table? 12 plus King Arthur, 13. 13. How many jurors on a trial? 12 plus the judge, 13. You see, in fact, wow. on the dollar bill, on the back of the dollar bill, the, 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 the 13 is repeated 13 times. There's 13 feathers in the eagle's tail, 13 olive branches, 13 arrows. 13 stripes of the plate, 13 steps in the, in the pyramid, 13, 13 times, because why? The number 13 is what? The number of transformation. 12 completes the cycle, 13 begins anew. So then how can we put this number 13 in our lives as it works for us? First, the seven principles of Kwanzaa. Umoja, unity, Kujitagalia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work responsibility, Ujama. Cooperative economics, Nia, purpose, Kumba, creativity, and Imani, faith. You have those seven, hold those seven. Add to that five C's, the five C's. The first C is consciousness, consciousness. I've dedicated the rest of my life to helping to raise the consciousness of African people. I do a radio program on the internet every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I talk about independence, self-determination, liberation, and sovereignty for African people. You know, consciousness. And consciousness is more than just awareness. Consciousness is a deeper understanding of who you are historically, who you are culturally. Consciousness. The next C is courage. Because once you have consciousness, you develop courage. You feel good about yourself. You stand proud. You have courage. The third C, confidence. Confidence, not ego. You ain't tripping, but you have confidence. 
You know you can get the job, you get the promotion, you know you can do the things that somebody probably thinks that you can't do because you have confidence. The third C, conscience. Conscience, knowing what is morally right and wrong and doing what's right. Standing on integrity, standing on principle. Doing the right thing when nobody is looking. Conscience. And the last C, conviction. Conviction. You, you have a conviction to, to complete a task. No, it didn't go the way that you wanted it to. There were detours and pitfalls, but you overcame them and you persevered. Why? Because you have conviction. How much is seven plus five? Twelve plus you? Thirteen. There you go. Put the number 13 in our daily lives and do this every day, 24-7, 365. Brothers and sisters, Shem Hotel means go in peace. Exante Sana means thank you. Bibi Fahodie, our victorious destiny. We will be victorious. Thank you. Shay. Happy Kwanzaa. Umoja. All right, family. My name is Julian, the general. And um, I'm here and I'm going to share with you all some um, instruments from the, some natural instruments. This right here is a conch shell. Um, in IT, it's called a limbe, and we used it for the sound of the revolution to commence our liberation. Thank you, brother. We'll see you for another piece uh, in a little bit. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to Brother Cass for inviting me to share with you all. And let's continue to support each other, family. Homes. I mean, beautiful closets and homes. And then we start doing them in public places like, like here. But, you know, every time we had them, people would share share the information, people would do poetry, sing, you know, it's really, really beautiful. And this display is outstanding. You know, you have the Kwanzaa symbols, you have the mat, which is this Kenti cloth, it's the mat foundation, the Kanara, which represents the male and female principle, the Kanara, the Mishima Saba, the Shuri Saba handles, the Kikumbe Sha Moja, and then of course the Mizoho, the fruit of the harvest. They got squash here, they got real, they got real stuff here, y'all. 
know, <laughs> give me that pomegranate, you know. And of course, Mahinde, some call it Bagunzi, Mahinde corn, which represents children, which represents children. I know of my Kwanza kid, uh, and I always talked about Kwanza to the young people that I would talk to back in the, when I was in Milwaukee. When I was in Milwaukee, I, I was a firefighter. And, and on my off days, I work a day off too, I would go into the schools and talk to our young brothers and, and sometimes even young sisters. And I always told them, I'm going to give you information that you're not going to get here. You know, I want to teach you things and show you things that help you elevate your consciousness. And, and so I know that for me, I had three years of corn. But I have two daughters. But the third year represented all the young people that I had worked with over those many years. Because, as you know, taking a, a kernel of corn, taking a kernel of corn and planting it, you get what? Exactly, more corn. And so that's why that's important. So these are the symbols of Kwanzaa. These are the symbols of Kwanzaa. Now, let me say this. If you don't have that, but yet you can find a candle, you can find a plant, you can find, uh, I mean, you can make it what you want it to be, okay? If you don't have a nice elaborate set, you don't have a machine massage, but you got a candle. Maybe you got a red, black, and green candle, one of each, red, black, and green, and you can use that. What I'm saying is anything that you can do to observe Kwanzaa and put Kwanzaa in the minds of your friends, of your family, that's what it's about. Continue to promote this idea. I know I was told uh, just recently that only 10% of us, only 10% of us celebrate Kwanzaa even know about Kwanzaa. That's uh, really uh, sad, especially as it's been around over 55 years. You know? But I've been through some really good Kwanzaa presentations where uh, the place was packed, you know, and the music, the dancing, the drumming, the poetry, the act, all of it, beautiful, showing, displaying who we are and celebrating the Ngusa Sala. Celebrating the Ngusa Sala. So, this is Kwanzaa. Those are the symbols. And of course, we mentioned the principles. And so I'm saying to you, make sure that you teach your children about Kwanzaa. Bring them to a Kwanzaa presentation or have Kwanzaa in your home. More important, teach them how important Kwanzaa is. As I said earlier, Kwanzaa is vitally important for us because once we embrace it, we're on our way to independence, self-determination, liberation, and sovereignty for us as Africans. Because why? We'll have unity. And the underlining theme, the underlining theme in Kwanzaa is unity. Unity. You cannot achieve any of the other principles without unity. That's why it is number one. Unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. Let those principles abide in us every day of our lives. Once again, brothers and sisters, Shem Hotel. You got 10 minutes? You want me to do something? Or you going to play some music? Why don't you tell us about how it all began? How uh, Dr. Karenga put all this into our place. Dr. Milana Karinga, working out of uh, Cal Long Beach, coming up into the 60s, and the problems that were happening in the 60s, as you know, the 60s were a turbulent time. I think that for those of us who came up in that time, it's very exciting. It really was a very exciting time, you know. And so Milano felt that we should have an observance 
of our African history, our African past, our African roots. So he took the concept of Kwanzaa. Okay. There you go. I definitely will do this. And so he um, came up with the idea of Kwanzaa. And, and part of it was through the Kawaita theory that he had. And, uh, and I, you know, I know that Milana Karina has done some things that we're not very happy with him about, but one thing that we all must give him love for, and that is the creation of Kwanzaa. But as I said earlier, it is not his, it is ours. It is ours. And we must embrace it. And we must make it manifest in our, in our homes, in our communities, in our nation. You know, we, we are trying to establish an African presence on the continent, trying to get rid of the Chinese, trying to get rid of the Europeans, the Koreans, you know, the Indians. Everybody's there. Everybody wants a piece of the continent but us. But us. A lot of us don't want to be African. That's why um, I know I was talking about one time that, you know, being are we African or are we black? And I know that many of us synonymous use black being and meaning African, you know. But I look at it this way. There must come a point in time to the same. Either shit or get off the pot. <laughs> okay? We are African people. We are Africans. I know there are some people who don't want to be African, but they want to be black. They want to be black. And that blackness is opposite of what being white is. They want the same thing that Caucasian has in terms of jobs, cars, jewelry, the material trappings, living in a gated community. And so look at here in Atlanta. Atlanta's ridiculous. Okay. Yes. Yes. Of Rudy's books are at Akavanhouse.com. Akavanhouse.com. Yeah. Well, they can hear you online. Okay. Yeah. Akavanhouse.com. And of course, you can buy books and many other things right here. At the black dot ultra center and bookstore here in life only. And I'm gonna tell you, I, I've seen Baba make this thing happen. In fact, it's great, it looks beautiful. Give Baba a hand, please. Ain't that beautiful? 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 This is ours. And, and, and there's nothing like having ours. You know, we ain't got to ask permission. We ain't got to beg nobody. We do it. We do it because we know it's right and it must be done. So, about Rudy's books are at, if you want to just take a note, uh, AkabinHouse.com. His books are AkabinHouse.com. Akabin, A U K B A N. Okay. Say it again. A K O. Oh, Akabin House. B. Okay. Or his books are online at Black.ccstore.com. Okay. Black.ccstore.com. Repeat it, please. Black.ccstore.com and the Akavan House account where you can buy Baba Baruti's books. And he has about 20 something books. <laughs> He's prolific. He is prolific. Man. Yeah. He is prolific. And it's outstanding. In fact, uh, I just received the second edition of the Inye Say Sim. A daily revolutionary thought. I read it. I read it before the program. I read the day before, the day of, 
And then when the next program comes on, I read it the day before, the day of. If it's on a weekend, on a Friday, I read it Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You know, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And sometimes I tell you, of a Rudy, in, in my subject matter, it just hits. I mean, it hits. You know? And so I got MBA Say Sim number two, and I, I can't wait to uh, go through the days utilizing that. So, all right, dear brothers and sisters, are we ready? We're going to go for another uh, election, and then hopefully Dr. Rudy will be on at that time. Okay. Okay. Brother, you up? Baby, can you hear me? Yeah, let me unmute you. You unmuted? I gotta unmute you again. Let me see. Here we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. All right. You up? All right. All right. Hey, hey, everybody. Kwanzaa, Umoja, Unity. And um, I have some Marvin Gaye for you. Um, this virtual is, is very different, but I'm glad to bring you greetings to help uplift some sounds to fellowship our Kwanzaa. Umoja.
All right. All right, brother. Hey, brother. Thank you, brother. You came through at the last minute for us. We've had entertainment every year, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? Continue to be strong and fruitful. Blessings to Black Dot. Blessings to downtown Lithonia, to Atlanta, to everybody, family. Julian the General, check me on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And I look forward to continuing these principles This that we are uplifting for Kwanzaa and Guzu Saba through Moja. Moja. Yes. Okay, so the question is, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Can everyone see the picture of Enia and I at the Black Dot last year about this time? Yeah, I see one thumbs up. I'm assuming that's for this. That's Brother John, I haven't seen him in, I'll say eons. Okay, so everybody can hear me, right? Someone raised their hand. What does that mean? Even though we use, and I'm trying not to waste time, but even though we use Zoom pretty much every day here, uh, there's a lot that I haven't mastered as of yet. So um, I will ask one more time and then I will begin. Can everyone hear me? If I can see you, raise your hand or say something or. Oh, that's a thumbs up, two thumbs up. Okay, all right. So it's time for us to get rocking and rolling here. Um, we are, I should say we are, cause it's not just myself. I never just speak for myself. Um, any of and I speak for each other and um, that's a good thing in this reality where we're trying to be African because we are family people by nature and we've gotten it all twisted up, which is a whole nother discussion. Um, but for those who, uh, Sister Ray, for those who are um, um, interested in, in looking at any of the material because Black Dot does carry our books, this is their website. And I will try to remember to put this up when I am finished. Nonetheless, here we go. Today is Emoja, and the short word for Emoja is unity. Uh, I should say Habarigani, but since um, I really can't hear what you're saying, I'm assuming that you're saying Umoja, which of course is the first day of, of Kwanzaa. And I believe that this is the word that we should be looking at first when we're talking about Kwanzaa, because if we don't have unity, then we really don't have too much of anything else. Um, when, generally speaking, when we hear a definition of umoja, it is to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Uh, I think that that is a very fundamental definition, but I don't think that it's, uh, how do I say, good enough. I think that that is, uh, you know, an excellent statement, but we're, we're at war. and um, some, sometimes we have to put things within the context of war and where we're trying to go, where we're trying to get, what we're trying to do. And the statement of whatever it is needs to indicate that. As in, when we see, use the word middle passage to describe um, us getting from the continent to here, 
that in no way, shape, or fashion speaks to the politics of that. It doesn't speak to the mentality or the uh, behavior of the European who brought us here. And it doesn't speak to the conditions that we had to operate on in that. As I explained to the children, the middle passage, if you have a hallway in your house that goes from one end of your house to the other, you could call that a middle passage because it is a walkway. It is a way to get from one end to the other. It's in the middle of whatever it is, and it is a passage. So even though this is uh, an excellent statement, I think that we need to go um, a little further than this. I think we need to take it a step further, and I believe Mama Remba has done that exceptionally well. She came out with, uh, a number of years ago, she came out with the principles of Kwanzaa, uh, I would say through the eyes of warriors. Uh, politicized, fully politicized, not just, you know, a generic um, something that uh, everyone can work through, if you will, if you will, because we have to be very careful when we're trying to make everybody understand when everybody doesn't want to understand or everybody or significant number of people want it watered down so that they can continue to um, not be African, if you will, but can continue to feel that they are Part of the process, and I don't think that that's good enough. You can't get into an argument with someone who has the dominant opinion and you know agree with what they're saying before you begin to say what you need to say, because then you're adding fuel to what they say. So Mama Rumba says, and for those of you who don't know who Mama Rumba is, you, you need to look her up. She is, as far as I'm concerned, at this particular point in time, she is. Um, our, our leading African-centered scholar, not just based upon her work in terms of her writing, not just based upon her work in terms of her creating the Ahab African, excuse me, African Heritage After School Program, not in terms of her character, which is consistently um, correct and along African lines, but because of how much she has worked for us and how long she has worked for us without compromise and selflessly, selflessly doing so. So Mama Rimba says, uh, when we're talking about emoji, we're talking about a pan-Africanist. So we know pan as a prefix means all. So all African people, as in the Garvey vision. He was, of course, wasn't the only one, but he's the one that most are familiar with, and we say pan-Africanist. The pan-Africanist vision, it is an idea or an ideal of what we're trying to get to is, is how we're supposed to view Reality, our worldview is supposed to be couched in a certain kind of, of a vision. And that's a Pan-Africanist vision of African people throughout the world joining forces to fight. That's the emoji we're talking about. African people joining forces to fight. Not just, you know, sort of looking at each other, maybe recognizing each other, or maybe even just seeing all African people as African, but joining forces to fight because we are at war. Or as Mom Rimble said, we are being warred upon. Joining forces to fight for African sovereignty. And I should have put that word, sovereignty, in a bold color as well, because that's supposed to be the goal. We're going to talk about sovereignty in a minute. For African sovereignty and constructing an African world order is not just going to fall into our laps. It's not just going to be something that happens because we wish it there. It's not going to do that just because we have a, a vision. A vision requires work. It requires pursuit. It requires doing the things that are necessary to make it happen and knowing that you can do it. If we can't talk about our ancestors were the greatest of this and the greatest of that. They could do anything and they were all powerful and then introduce the word can't into our statement. We're supposed to be our ancestors. We are our ancestors for those who know. And if we are, then can't shouldn't be part of our vocabulary relative to creating sovereignty for African people. So Umoja, we're talking about coming together as an army, coming together as a force to be reckoned with by anybody who wants to get into our way. And yes, we can say that with all the aggression that we need to say it in because we're trying to build something that will be so bad, as we used to say back in the 70s, that nobody can touch it again. 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide because this is what I do all year long. Talk about what happened to us. How did we get to this point? This is Nadir in civilization and society as a people. What happened to us where we could, and when you talk to the little ones to help them to understand, you have to imagine a people who were talking about the pyramids and we're talking about the uh, the, the, the her and McKenna. We're talking about all of these things that we did that were great. We're talking about the, the mystery system. We're talking about all these civilizations across the African continent over hundreds of thousands of years. We're talking about all of this, all this greatness, all this creation, all of, all of this genius at work. So how do we get from here to here? What happened? It, it wasn't accidental. Now, we, of course, had some, uh, made a contribution to that, but we have to understand the bulk of what went on. We have to understand what our issues are, too, because we have to fight our own demons. We have to deal with the issues that we have and the mistakes that we made. And in looking at the mistakes that we made, that can help us to figure out how to bring that vision to fruition. There are things that we did. One of the things that we consistently hear about is, is the understanding that we treated people who uh, were not human as if they were human. We treated people who saw us as food, as if they were eating with us. We acted like um, these people being a xenophilic people, loving of other people, curious about other people. We thought that everybody was like us. We thought that when you treated people fairly, that they would treat you fairly. They didn't come in looking to see uh, ways to destroy you, to enslave you, to use you to build their empire. And we did build their empire. Read Eric Williams' uh, Capitalism and Slavery. He made multiple points, but one of the most important ones there, which I read in a number of other places, was that the European nation rose because we fell. It wasn't a European country here and there. It wasn't a few Europeans. No, their entire nation pan-European nation rose because we fell. And we fell because we were taken down. We fell because people came in looking for ways to break, break us. And they're still looking for ways to break our spirit. We, we fell because we believed in the goodness of people. We believed in helping people. So that's kind of like taking on a life of a person. I mean, we, we don't go into a discussion of how we got here. If you don't understand how we got here, don't know how we got here, which is no problem. At some point in time, I didn't know. Then we, we get a copy of my book, K-Buka. Read it. That should answer a few of the questions about how we got here. But now we have become so mentocidal. It means that we have it's like scooping out our own brain, our own sense of who we are. And this was, this was not a choice that we made. This was a choice that was made for us and forced upon us. It's like losing your mind and having someone else's mind placed in your mind, but not thinking like them, thinking like how they want you to think about yourself. Many, many of us, and there's varying degrees of us, as Kobe K.K. Cambone said, all of us have some degree of mental side, and I agree. I'm not someplace where I'm above everybody else or beyond folks because I know this or I know that or I've read this. I've read that. I tell folks all the time. A number of years ago, I'm walking through Walmart, and I, I'm sitting there. I woke up from this dream, and I'm, I'm walking through Walmart singing Christmas carols. Along with the, you know, the, 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 the whatever piped in music. And that shut me down real quick. Okay? If there was any ego involved in thinking that I'm beyond this and better than this, no, that stopped with that. So we have to, we have to understand we have taken on a personality, a sub-personality, if you will, that has caused us now to allow those folks who at one time had to expend enormous amount of energy controlling us to sit back and let us do their destruction for them, even though they're still contributing significantly. So we're no longer surprised when we see like this little girl at the bottom looking up at the casket of a little girl trying to figure it out. These things shouldn't surprise us anymore. They don't surprise us anymore. We even might get upset about something that has happened to us. And a week later, we, we, we forgot it all. 
We're back to the business of destroying African people in service of Europeans. And that's the opposite of what we're supposed to be thinking about today and for the next 365 days. Moji means unity, means us coming together. So I want to talk about how to build unity. I've listened to a lot of lectures and I've given a lot of lectures talking about what we just talked about in detail. But I want to talk tonight, maybe, maybe for the first time in a long time, I want to talk about how to build unity at different levels. And we're supposed to be doing this, and people are asking, you know, how do we do this? Stop complaining. And my mother would say, shut up or do something about it. You need to talk about how we can do this in commonsensical, everyday, basic terms. Not some highfalutin way, you know, wherever uh, um, theory or concept, Baba Hannibal F. Reed. I don't, I don't want to hear your theory. Show me your work. Show me your work. We need to be showing work. And not to other people. That's, that's another part of this issue that we need to get out of. We need to, we need to show the world what we did. We need, no, we need to show ourselves. The world knows. The world is wondering what the world we're doing allowing this to happen and we're talking about well we're responsible for the planet we were the <clears throat> first people and we've been given you know divine this in terms of run, running things etc etc well then we're not doing our work because if we were then things would be the way that they're supposed to be so the things i'm getting ready to talk about as i said at the bottom of the slide they're interchangeable solutions for these different levels Okay, so anything that I talk about, whether I'm talking about the family, whether I'm talking about the nation, whatever, those solutions can be applied at any level. Macro, micro, family, nation, everywhere. You start out, how do we unify? How do we build Umoja in the family? <clears throat> But to realize that we are a family, child-centered people. That's the realization of that, the consideration of that, the serious, giving that serious thought, exactly what does that mean? That we are a child-centered people. <clears throat> you know, the <clears throat> research, studies, statistics, they show that even though our families are the most bombarded, family is the first institution the Europeans attack, and they're the, that's the institution the Europeans are still attacking the most today. And the primary reason for that is that's where socialization occurs. Socialization is the process of a newborn, if you will, or even before, learning how they're supposed to be in their family, in their community, in the world. That's socialization. And we, we, we prioritize family child-centeredness first. And when we look at at least everything that I've read about traditional African society that had to do with some form of education. We're looking at a people who see the development of an individual's character to be the most important aspect of their socialization. And why would that be? Because if you are a communal people, that means that you operate within the framework of community. Then you have to have people of good character or you won't have a community. If everybody walk around lying, cheating, stealing, killing, then you're not going to have a community, community because you can't trust each other. That's logical. We are a family, child-centered people. Just be, beyond the fact that we love people, beyond the fact that we understand our role in a natural sense, that we study the universe to see how order was supposed to be maintained, the kind of people that we were supposed to do. And we created society based upon that model because we understood that model to be so much more greater than us. So we understood that we are our family-centered people and it's the responsibility of the adults to provide and protect for the children. That's understood. We have to return to that. All these, the, 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 that vision of African sovereignty, that nation building vision that we're supposed to have, at the center of it is supposed to be family. And at the center of family, is, of course, is supposed to be complementarity. The relationship of commitment between a man and a woman, that's supposed to be the center of it, period. If we are calling ourselves African, if we call ourselves something else, well, then that may not apply. But if we're calling ourselves African, if we're saying these people are ancestors and we're saying our ancestors weren't stupid, 
and we're not being, you know, choosy. We pick this and we pick that and we pick this and we pick that out of, out of our serious, spiritually grounded traditions. Instead of putting it all together and mixing it in with some other people's mess, then we know that we need to go back to the source. That Sankofa journey backward to gain a knowledge of self and bring it forward. Because that spirit doesn't change. I don't care what the what the nature of the society that you're operating in. You're African, you're African. You are very child, very family centered people. And that's our first and foremost priority. As a people, that's always been our first and foremost priority as a people. And within that context that providing and protecting. We're, we're people of the circle, virtually everywhere you look when you're talking about African. Whatever, there's a circle involved. Circle is our, our most common, most, most known, most uh, infused geometric shape. We operated in our communities, we operated in our families using a concentric circle model or concentric, concentric sphere. We want to talk about spirit because circle is flat. We're talking about the entire environment that we operated in but those there were three layers to that three very basic layers to that the outermost layer was the layer that the men operated in because the men were the most mobile for a reason didn't put men above women we didn't play that mess they were the first ones to encounter the enemy they ran the greatest interference militarily they were the first line of defense and the next inner circle was a circle of the women. Because you didn't really want to have to deal with the women any more than you want to have to deal with the men. As uh, Mussolini and his boys found out when they went to Ethiopia, they would prefer to fight the men than the women. Because the women who could fight equally well, they were then angry because you had done some damage to the men. So you would be getting that anger along with just the basic combat skills. And in the innermost circle, you had the elders and you had the children. And I don't want to go off on major tangents like this, but we, when we looked at nature, we saw that those things that were most important were the ones that were most protected. Everywhere in nature, you see that. Everywhere in nature, you see that. Everywhere in nature, you see that. The thing that is the most vulnerable, the thing that in many cases is the most important has the greatest layers of protection around it, has the greatest forces of protection around it. So if you just look at your body, which is a natural phenomenon, you see that the most important thing on your body is completely and totally encased in, in bone. Your brain has got a skull completely around it because it needs the greatest protection. It's the most important thing. Without that, I mean, you, you can cut out somebody's heart, maybe put in an artificial one. You can cut off arms. You can cut off legs. You can pull out, you know, one of the kidneys. You might even be able to pull out a chunk of the liver because it'll grow back. Some of it will grow back. You can take out all kinds of stuff. But you cut off somebody's head, that's the end of the discussion. You open up their skull and take out their brain, that's the end of the discussion. And you find the next most important part of your body, your heart, Behind not only ribs, but a breastplate plate, plate in the front and in the back. That's the second most part, important part of your body. People argue, well, the ribs don't go down far enough, so you know, because those are where your next most important organs are. Yeah, because people gain weight and it's got to go somewhere. You get pregnant, baby's got to go somewhere. So if the ribs went all the way down, you couldn't, that couldn't happen. The only good argument I've heard against that or that might undermine that is that reproductive organs don't have any bone around them. But then if they did, then they couldn't do their work. So that concentric zone, concentric zone model is extremely important. The elders and the children, the elders have all the wisdom. That doesn't mean everybody else is walking around without thinking, blah, blah, blah. But the elders have the wisdom that carries the people forward. They have the experience of knowledge. So they have the wisdom. And as has been said time and time again, who better to teach the children than the elders? If you, if you want to understand 
really the fundamentals of that relative to women in particular, read Fukiao's The Congo Art of Babysitting. It's an extremely important, extremely thin, important book. Very, very important book for warriors. So those concentric zone circles, those concentric circles, those concentric spheres, they were a natural model. They were based on a natural model that model that was found throughout the universe. Throughout the universe, everywhere you see life, you see this model. And we are a people that looks to the universe to determine what is good for us, not like arrogant people who try to take make the universe look like them. We try to define the universe in terms of, of them and their peculiarities. Some of us who have decided that we really want to pursue this sovereignty, who decided that we really want to be African. We've run into problems with, with some family members, and we've run into problems with folks who look like us. Because many of them love their menticide. Many of them love their enemies. Many of them do not understand the concept of enemy. Many of them do not understand we're being destroyed because they're still alive. Many of them don't understand because some of their best friends, if not all of their best friends, are enemies of us. Many of them even sleep with the enemy. So they want to chastise us. They want to correct us. They want to minimize us. And of course, my only statement about that part of the process is that no warrior should allow him or herself to be disrespected, period. I just read earlier today, somewhere online, someone said, um, if uh, you can't love somebody who you don't respect. And my little 64 years on this planet tells me that's correct. So if a person is disrespecting you, I'm not talking about you know, we do a little joke on it. No, no, when someone's disrespecting you and you know when someone's disrespecting you, then there ain't no love there. So we have to, but we need family as well, which is the point of building family within, which is, as FYI, a chapter in my book, Centered. We should have family as well. We need to have friends. We need a family. Warriors shouldn't be deprived of the love of family, of the support of family, of the encouragement of family, of the presence, just the physical presence of family. Just to be near people of like minds is, is extremely motivating. It's an extremely good feeling. So we have to, for every, we, we can use the, 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 I guess, mathematical equation that for every family member, Every person in the community who we thought was a friend, anybody else who wants to use the race card, i.e. they can tell you what to do because you look like them, they need to be replaced with someone of like mind. We shouldn't just like European holidays. Okay, we don't, we don't celebrate European holidays no more, and then we have nothing of our own to, to celebrate. We're just like lost, bored, silly, angry, no release, no enjoyment. No company of our own. We need to replace. That needs to be a rule in our mind somewhere. For everyone that I lose, I need to gain someone who is serious about being African, someone who is us. That's building family within. And folks need to take that very, I think folk warriors particularly need to take that very seriously because that's one of the major complaints in anger, frustration, tears that I've heard from warriors people who they thought loved them. When their politics went against menticide, when their religion, spirituality went against menticide, suddenly they weren't worth the dirt underneath the other person's shoes, and then they clicked. Oh, okay, no respect. In the family, in terms of this unity, building this unity, we, we, we have to protect each other. We have to protect each other. And I'm not talking about just my family or my circle. If there is another circle, I need to be on guard for them too. If there's a centered circle, I think that we need to be selfish. And there are many reasons for that beyond just the fact that you only have so much time and so much energy. 
and it needs to be correctly directed. So I call, uh, just wrote a book called Common Sense Security, and most of the things in there were things that I was taught, things that I learned by watching, things that I was told, things that, that I, I learned through practice, what, was, what made the most sense based on common sense. Because common sense isn't so, so common anymore. It can be. So I've seen so many situations which were dangerous for us within our families. I've seen we're at war. We're supposed to be warriors. So they act, act like that. We're not just walking around trying to claim something. We need to act on what we say. If I'm, if I'm a father, then you should see me acting like that to the best of my ability. If I'm a warrior, then I need to act like I'm at war. And there shouldn't be any situation, any point that the, the, warrior, the, 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 the war doesn't stop for me to go to the bathroom. The war doesn't stop for me to sit down. And Things need to be in place so that my concerns relative to the safety of my family and my community are in place in a way that there are times when I can have a lot of comfort, when I can rest. Because you can't be on, on edge all stressed up all the time. So there are things that we... I see people in the center community don't think about because, well, number one, we bring a lot of the mental side into the center community from that insanity out there. There's so much of it, it's hard to, it's very hard. Like I said, I'm singing Christmas carols in, in Walmart. It's hard to get rid of all of it. You just got to work at it, work at it, and work at it. Life is a process. So I see things that scare me relative to the security of, of our families. I see, I've seen people come to our house many over the years and they'll have little children and we love to have them here. But the little child will go to the door and start playing with the keys and start to try to open up the door. Three-year-old, two-year-old, four-year-old without any sense whatsoever of the danger that's outside the door. And I see Parents laughing, thinking that it's cute. And that child could open the door and everybody's dead in that house. So that's one of those common sense things that we should never have happen. We should never see happen. We should train our children accordingly. This is a dangerous world, especially dangerous for us. Those of us who are African-centered, because we are the worst of the enemy for Yorubu. We refuse to be nice and forget. So things like that, little, little boys wanting to be the man of the house because dad isn't physically there. But they don't perform the role. They open up the door without looking through the people, without looking through the blinds, without looking under the car to see if there's any movement of shadows from the other side, without looking to the sides of the house to see if there's any potential threat. And that's, not the only, that's not the only thing I'm talking about in this book, but there are many things that we need to consider that can quickly become second nature, common sense in the protection of the family, keeping it unified. How much destruction to the unification of a family is going to happen because someone made a silly mistake and somebody got hurt badly and now the defenses are really down? Whoever it is, everybody in the family holds a defensive role. Everybody does. So I would ask, of course, I want you to read what I wrote, but particularly this book, Common sense security. There's not a whole lot of politics in it. So folks, you know, run away from it because they see the word African or they see, you know, black people. I didn't do a whole lot of that in there because I want to scare too many people away. And some folks are trying to walk in this direction and they need to have read it before they walk towards it, walk into the center. Because our job. In terms of maintaining unity, because if your children's minds and even some of the adults minds are attracted by the glitter of insanity. Then chaos is introduced. No one's really paying attention. And next thing you know, it's, it's destroyed. I've seen it too many times. So we have the responsibility in terms of unity, in terms of emotion, of creating safe, sacred spaces. Safe, sacred. We are a divine people. And when we act like divine people, 
in particular spaces, those spaces become sacred. You got to look at it like you can say your house is, is a shrine or your residence is a shrine. Your land is a shrine and you should act toward it accordingly. That's that's an extension of you. That's a reflection of you. But as so many of our warrior scholars have said, everything in your home should reflect you. You should everywhere you go, you should see you. Pictures, cloth, whatever, everything should reflect you. Music, everything should reflect you. So we're trying to build those places where we can be African. Out, out there, you know, you can't be because then you're going to be taken as a fool. But in these safe, sacred spaces, we need to be who we are. We need to be able to be who we are. We can take a hint of that from the Maroons when they left the plantations. Certainly they were trying to get away from that heaven. Certainly they were trying to get away. But they weren't going someplace, and the record shows this clearly. They weren't just running away. Go someplace to create some black European society. They were going in, they were recreating African society. The Quilombos, the Maroons, they were all about the business of escaping to establishing African space, safe, sacred African space. And if we're following our tradition, if we are our ancestors, we should be doing the same thing instead of hoping that someone else is going to protect us. Or those who serve them will protect us. Our job as a family in terms of unity is to have that vision that goes forward intergenerationally. To our children's 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 children's, children's, children's to the 2000th power and beyond. So we're supposed to be rearing warriors. Sister by the name of Marie Evans wrote a poem entitled, what was her poem? Um, Speak the truth to the people. One of the best poems I've ever read in my life. And you need to search for that online, which is separate from what I'm talking about now. But search Marie Evans, M-A-R-I Evans. She's now an ancestor. And the poem is titled, Speak the Truth to the People. But she wrote an essay where she distinguished between rearing children and raising them. And we in the center, we who are doing this work, we who want to practice the principle of Umoja need to be rearing children because then they understand their purpose. They understand why they're here. They understand what in them they have to hone. They have to understand what they're supposed to do with the skills that they acquire. They have to understand that warriors serve, that they're being brought up to be warriors for African people because we are at war. Or again, to use Mama Rumba's term, we are being warred upon. She said, raising warriors means that you, you provide for them, you know, shelter, clothes, uh, you know, whatever the things they need for school, transportation, you know, food, all the things they need to be healthy, to, to, to be alive. And the difference between raising and rearing is that when you're rearing a child, you give them all that too within reason because within rearing children, you really make a distinction between wants and needs, something that has become really, really lost as our children become more and more spoiled. Spoiled children don't make good warriors. They make good bodies, dead bodies, but they don't make good warriors because they don't understand that they're a warrior. The only thing they can see is me. Rearing means that you not only do that within a common physical framework, but you also teach them their politics. We know that every statement is political. We teach them about who they are, what has happened to us in real terms. To use another guy, Wade Noble said, if you don't teach your children who they are without compromise, then you have no character. So we're supposed to be teaching them who they are, what is being done to us, their responsibility to African people. That's rearing them versus raising them. You allow somebody else to give them their politics and then you get surprised because they turn on you. In the family, we are supposed to be promoting unity through being. 
We don't need any contradiction here. Through being and instilling my own qualities in our warriors in training, my own qualities, my true justice, order, balance, righteousness, reciprocity, all those qualities, all of those principles, all of those oracles, if you will, that speak to what it means to be an African of good character. It listed the Ten Commandments were taken care of. Why? Why would our answers have put so much emphasis everywhere you go on the continent at every point in time? You see this enormous emphasis on character. Go talk to somebody who's part of who's part of the Yoruba spiritual system. The heaviest emphasis there is on the quality of your character, and that's about as African as you can get. We're supposed to not only explain to them, tell them, show them over there somewhere what are good African qualities. We're supposed to model it so there's no contradiction between what we think, say, and do. So they don't see a contradiction, especially in the area of character. Because they're going to, the children are genius, as we say, they're going to take it to a whole nother level. So we have to be as well as instill, as well as make part of who they are. So they can run. They grow up, you know, and they decide they don't want to be African. Well, they can run, but they can't hide. They can't hide. They can't pretend that they didn't know. And what are some of those qualities, those good qualities, those good characteristics that reflected Africans that we need to instill and be? Some of these are taken from a number of different um, texts, um, taken from the, 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 the neophyte rules from the comedic mystery system. They come from all over. And even though I didn't put them in any order, this first one should be first. Because reverence sets the mentality. Reverence sets the level of respect within the community. And we, as our, ch and as, as our children, we should revere, hold in high esteem the creator, Asasiya, Mother Earth, which I found logical but phenomenal when I learned, I don't know, years ago that in the libations for African people, next to the creator is Mother Earth. Of course, you don't pour libation for the creator because the creator... You don't pour libation for the creator, but you pour libation for Sasia and everybody and everything else. But Sasia is second. I found that amazing, especially looking at us today, the way we treat Mother Earth and the way we allow people being the first ones who are responsible, being the caretakers. We are allowing others to mistreat Mother Earth. Jacob Carruthers' uh, intellectual warfare talks about how Earth is seen as mother by Europeans, but in the most derogatory way, the same way they have historically seen their women or anything feminine or female. So they don't have a problem with this, but we should. Every time we see somebody drop some litter on the ground, that should hurt. It's your mother. Without her, you don't live. You don't live. But we bought into this selfish mentality. As long as I got mine right now, I don't care. And as long as I got my life, I don't care about anybody else. I don't care how I treat the earth. As long as as long as she's letting me, you know, provide. And in fact, I separate myself from that because I don't want to be associated with anything spiritual, emotional, any of the rest of that, because that makes me less of a person. Anyway. Reverence for the creator, the deities, ancestors, living ancestors. And elders, this is how we travel through time or around time or however you want to phrase it. This is how we move from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. We pass ourselves on. We're supposed to pass on the best of who we are. We're supposed to take the best who we are. Every, every old person isn't an elder. Some of them, as the young folks tell me, they're just olders because just like raising and rearing, they don't have an alliance. They don't have a loyalty. They have no commitment. They have done nothing for African people. In fact, they've worked against us in many cases. 
So there's a difference between elders and ancestors. I'm not saying are old folks when I say elders. That doesn't mean I disrespect them. But I'm not going to hold them at the same level of esteem or listen to their word in the same way as I do elders. Have to be very careful there. Everybody, we want to we pretend you got to include everybody. But no, I don't know any people on this planet who include as their ancestors people who treat uh, uh, committed treason against them. I don't know of anybody except for us. Because we're trying to be this humanist model for everybody else, as well as the fact that we're afraid to dismiss anybody who Europeans love. And most of the people Europeans love are our traitors. We have to pass on in terms of that unity, self-love. If you don't love yourself, you can't. How are you going to love other people and create community, create unity? You have to look for see who you can to see who you can hurt. You you probably have a lot of self hate. Maybe I'm speculating here, but in this society, in Western society, you see a lot of self hate, and that self hate comes out. It comes out against people who look like you because you're afraid to deal with Europeans in that way. So it's sort of like you you the bully, which was a a, a bad thing within. African society, in fact, for a lot of uh, in a lot of societies, we see that you are considered to be pretty much a punk if you pick on somebody in terms of a fight, somebody who you know you can beat, somebody who's weaker than you. But we do this here. Self-care. We gotta t- take care of ourselves. We can teach our children to take care of ourselves so that we can, for lack of better words, last. Self-defense, which comes back to that common sense security. But that unity, if we can't defend ourselves, I've said before a thousand times, if you can't defend it, be it something living or, you know, an inanimate object, if you can't defend it, then it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you because we operate in a reality of thieves. We operate in a reality of... You win by taking, especially things that don't belong to you. We live in a reality where work is being able to tell other people to do what you're supposed to be doing. You're the real worker. And have unity to self-control because sometimes things don't need to be said. I found it amazing. Um, I was reading about some blacksmiths in the uh, Traditional African society and a rural African society, um, and their uh, apprenticeships of of young boys. And these boys who came into these apprenticeships, they weren't allowed to talk for the first seven years of their apprenticeship. And not not talk like they can't talk. But I, let me rephrase that: they weren't allowed to ask questions. They had to listen to the masters and think. It was a process of improving the quality of their thinking as well as the silence that's required for you to understand things better, to think about them better. And go and look at any traditional African society, and you're going to see those two. There are more proverbs about silence than there are about anything else. I wonder why. That must have something to do with the priority African people had. They understood the importance of people being silent and thinking, going within. We have to teach our children to be courageous. You can't have a community. You can't have unity. You can't have a mojo, a mojo without courage. Everybody is scaredy cat, running from anything, everything, everywhere. You, you won't have community. You won't have family because it's going to be scattered. All of everybody running. Even not even a plan for running, just running. Diligence and work. We have to do it no matter what, because it's for the benefit of the family. We have to do things that we don't want to do because it's for the benefit of family. We have to sacrifice. Another one of those principles that you find among the Yoruba and so many other African spiritual systems. There's a reason for that because it benefits the great good. It also builds you. 
It builds your power. So I say about marriage, that's one of the reasons why they have us now at each other's throat and even the idea of getting married. We're more hateful of marriage than anything else. I could talk about this for hours, but it's, and I've talked to older folks who have been married who are in the center. And that'll tell you in a half a second. They've never, there's nothing, there's never been anything in their life as difficult as marriage. There's never been anything that difficult in their lives. But they wouldn't trade it for the world because of the level of strength that they get out of that. Struggle makes you stronger. Sacrifice makes you stronger. It builds your character. It builds your strength. But those things that weaken us, we're set to pursue. Those things that strengthen us, we're turned away from. Because we need to be kept weak. But we thinking that it's a game, we assume that we're doing the right thing. Sense of communality, being a community, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an attitude, that's a mentality. That's a way of approaching things. Like back in the day when you walked through town or you walked through your part of town, you better speak to everybody you see and you better mean it. Because you were family, just like in our tradition. Every man in the community was a baba. Every woman in the community was a mama. Every man was your father. Every woman was your mother. What is a perfect example of that for me was the practice in this community where when the baby was was uh, a little a little old not i'm thinking like a couple of weeks or something like that i can't remember exactly but the all of the women would form a circle and they would pr- pass that baby from one breast to the next and let that baby suckle on each breast so he would know all of his mothers or she would know all of her mothers that to me is is That's indescribable in terms of its impact relative to the idea of family or community, the idea of umoja. You got to teach about teaching chastity, fidelity. What breaks up a family quicker? What breaks up a community quicker? Because marriage is between families. In our tradition. So what happens when somebody involved in that relationship gets involved with somebody who's not in that relationship. And they're not supposed to be involved with that person. Kindness, you can't, I don't don't really think we need to go into how kindness benefits unity, how it benefits emoji. We remember those people who did good things to us, good things for us, who helped us when we couldn't help ourselves, helped us when we were in need. That's glue. That's cement, that, that, that's binding, spiritually binding stuff. Righteousness, doing the right thing. If you want children to have unity, then we have to have them strong. We have to have them courageous. We have to have them knowing that they're doing the right thing. And anything that comes along that goes against what they're taught in their family, and they can see that it's dangerous or damaging, then of course, they don't want to go in that direction because they know that it's not righteous. Honesty, trustworthiness, same thing along the same lines. Protecting the innocent, the most vulnerable. That's always the role of any family, of any community. If someone needs more assistance, then they get more assistance. Why? Because they're family. Why? Because they're part of the village. They're part of the community. So automatically, there's not any, any thought that person, you know, got a, got a wicked temper or that that person is, is sometimes kind of selfish. That's irrelevant. Because people have different personalities. People are going to learn different than other people. People are going to feel things different than other people. So we can't make judgments based upon that. Devotion of purpose, diligence. That's from one of the neophyte rules. In the comedic mystery system, devotion of purpose. Our purpose is unity. Our purpose is a nation. Our purpose is a people because we understand that through an organization of people, through a seeing, people seeing themselves as one, comes power. Building distinguish right from wrong, that righteousness. Nepotism, 
oh my goodness, no, we can't talk about nepotism because we know nepotism through how Europeans hire in their families and in their communities and folks who look like them and pay them higher than they do us because they're family. We know the difference between being on a slaver, being brought here as an enslaved African from Africa and riding on a boat as an indentured servant from Europe. We understand how they treat themselves. Part of the problem, though, is that some of us, because we don't want to carry that forward, we just go throughout the whole idea. We throw out the baby with the bathwater. Nepotism is a good thing. Everybody does it but us. Wonder why? <coughs> Excuse me. There was a grocery store. <coughs> I live in West End, Atlanta, Georgia. <coughs> and about 30 years ago, about 20 years ago, there was a grocery store that's about maybe 10 blocks from here. It was a Korean grocery store. <clears throat> Once a month, these Koreans had a meeting in the city, but they had it there. Folks came there, but I had their conversation. And at these meetings, they introduced you know, new people, and this was a Korean-only meeting. It's like The information came from a student who was Korean. They um, have this meeting. They introduce new members, new, new Koreans that just moved to the city in these meetings, et cetera, et cetera, those who came. And then they went through the list of where they were supposed to buy their grocery store from, their cars from, their clothes from, who this, what doctor they were supposed to go to, because all of the people who they were telling them to go to were them. They kept it inside. Everybody does this but us. We're running around trying to prove to everybody how unracist we are. Like we could be racist in the first place, but how unracist we are by bending over backwards to give other people our resources. Bending over backwards to try to get the love of people who may pretend it, but you're not getting to those resources. Not in any way compared to them. Not in any way compared to them. In any way compared to them. Able to distinguish the real from the unreal. That's from the comedic message system also, but that take too long to explain. Um, so we'll skip down one more because the transference of complementarity and family responsibility we've been talking about on and off all the time. Respect between the sexes. That's extremely important. A lot of us are missing that. We've, we've ate that European patriarchy. We've done a lot of other things that has one sex inferior to the other sex, less than the other sex. <clears throat> we got to reverse that. Because when I was a child, you didn't see a lot of that. I, I saw homes where, um, in fact, Virtually all the homes in our community were, were there was a married couple. Uh, I could count the ones on my hand where there wasn't. So that's changed along with this. Um, but I grew up in a home. I always give this an example because it's always firsthand for me. And I call them domains. So uh, I, would, I might be at Black Dot right now. But health in this family is NEI's domain. And I have some say in it, but if any I says, well, we're not till this COVID mess is over, whether it's real or not, we're not going to be doing any public things, then I'm not going to argue with it. That's her domain. And in, in the area of security, if I say that door needs to be locked 24-7, nobody enters or exits it, then that door isn't open by her because that's my domain. And it's not because I'm superior to her or she's uh, superior to me in terms of where I want to go and where I can and cannot go. It's just that we respect each other based upon these domains. And I grew out of a family where um, I begin to, to, I guess, put together this idea of domains, even though it's not new. Um, and I was, as a little child, as a little boy, my father was in the military. So he was the one who was bringing home the largest check, even though she had like three or four part-time gigs. He had two or three other part-time gigs. Uh, but that was the main check. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching him come home every two weeks 
or once a month and handing her his check. And then every week I'm watching her give him or dole him out an allowance. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the way it's supposed to, that can't be what I'm going to be expecting. This can't, life can't be like that. I mean, it's like, you know, I should have some say on better, more say on what happens with my money. Right. Then I understood later on what he understood. He was bad with money. She was able to buy him a brand new 1975 Volkswagen, orange Volkswagen Super Beetle cash. Okay, and that's controlling for prices for today. She paid off a mortgage in 11 years and sold the house and moved and got land and outside of Dothan, Alabama and had a house built from scratch because she knew how to handle money. And he understood that. So that was her domain. And she knew that he knew about security, military operations, et cetera, et cetera. So if he said, no, we're going to bar off that window or what have you, that was really the end of the discussion. It wasn't inferior or superiority. It was just understanding of domain. So we need to get back. If we want to have family that survives, that's strong, that's not always argumentative about every single solitary thing, there needs to be the return of respect, of African respect between the sexes. And to teach our children, if we want unity, loyalty to our people, that that should be pretty self-explanatory. If you're not loyal to the to the people, if you are a traitor, then obviously you're not building toward unity. You're building toward disunity. Attain and pursue higher aspirations. That benefits everybody in the community. The better the individuals in the community are, then the better the community is. Communal economics. We just talked about that with nepotism, resilience. I don't care how many times somebody in the family or the family falls. I don't care. They get back up. That's an African tradition. You get knocked down, you get back up. You get knocked down, you get back up. You get knocked down, you get back up. And each time you get back up stronger. Dedication, just like loyalty. And studiousness. Everybody should be studying in their area. Their chosen area of expertise. The chosen area of expertise. Okay, good. So I just went to the messages to make sure that Brother Kazim Day wasn't telling me to end it. So we'll move forward. My best advice to everybody on this, uh, things that I've had to do in life, things that I've had to learn in life, all the rest of that, that's a lot of things to do. That's a lot of changes for people to make. And I'm talking about people who have good hearts. That's a lot of things to do. So whenever I came to a situation where there are multiple things that I had to handle, improve on, what have you, and I could try them all at one time, but I discovered when you try to do a whole bunch of things at one time, then you end up failing. And that makes it worse. Just like when people try to quit smoking cigarettes and then they come back, they end up smoking more. Yes, I know. They end up smoking more. So you got to pick one. And I say pick the worst one. Pick the most difficult one of that list of 20 things that you need to improve on. Pick the one that is the most difficult that you see you're going to have the most trouble with and pursue it. Don't worry about the other ones. Don't worry about the other ones, the impact of the other ones, anything. Like that. Don't worry about the other ones. Just pick one and master it. And what you're going to find out is once you master that, the other ones, mastering them, handling them, make, it becomes a much, much easier thing to do. So pick one. Pick one. Master it. One of these qualities we talked about that we need to pass on to our young folks, the children who we are rearing, pick one. All of these are difficult to me especially if you're not, not exhibiting them, all of them are difficult. And master it. In terms of the community. Community, of course, are extended families. And we're talking about how to build Umoja, how to build unity in the community, that concentric circles model that we talked about in terms of protection, in terms of everything else. That applies equally here. Common sense security applies equally here. Communalism, that sense of community, where we love and we work for each other requires accountability. That was Nana John Henry Clark. If you don't know anything by him, you need to read him. 
this ancestor, our story, and I think he was probably our best, our story. His, his pet peeve, the thing that irritated him the most, was African people's lack of accountability to each other, for each other. That means that I act as if I'm you. I want the best for me. I want the best for you. I want the best for everybody in the community, and I act accordingly. I hold myself responsible to the health and welfare of everybody in the community. I do my best work all the time for everybody in the community. And of course, I'm going to benefit automatically, but the goal is to improve the quality of life in the community by remaining accountable, which is no less important or no more important than trust, development of trust. You can't have a community without trust. You can't have a relationship without trust. If you're in a, if you're in a relationship and there's no trust, you're not in a relationship. You need to, I, I tell folks all the time we're talking about, come to us for, for advice about relationship. If you don't trust that person, you need somebody else. You need to move away. Because trust is like the heart. It's the foundation. It's the cornerstone of any relationship or any set of relationships. You can't trust that person or those people, then you need to be someplace else. If you want to be safe, You want to pursue interest and not expect them, not expect to wake up in the morning and everything that you have is gone. Or you're hanging from a tree someplace. It's got to be trust. It's got to be trust. Communalism requires accountability. Communalism requires trust. Communalism requires diligence. You can't have laziness within a community. I've seen so much of that within the quote unquote conscious community where people will sit and watch and pretend that they're trying to help with something, but they never, somehow they never get their hands on whatever needs to be carried, or they never, never end up really, you know, digging into the dirt. They just sort of supervise and go around and advise and maybe put the hole in the ground and pull it, pull it back up and go someplace else. And the fertilizer that needs to come up off the truck, somehow they never make it to the truck or make it to the shovel that's putting the, the fertilizer into the wheelbarrow and taking it back to the garden. They somehow never are able to, 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 to make it there. And then when they're all over, they're standing with everybody else smiling like they did something. Same thing with education. Teachers versus educators. Same thing with security. I've seen brothers who spoke on security, and they're like everywhere but being secure. In conversations with everybody, playing around with everybody, instead of being security. Communalism requires bartering. Whatever skills we have, we have to use them in trade with other folks. Exchange, equal exchange with other folks. We have to stop looking outside of us. And those skills that we don't have, we need to get. John Henry Clark again, Nana John Henry Clark again, talked about how when enslavement was over and Black males had jobs away from home because they had to work on other people's farms or plantations or whatever, even though they, quote, unquote, weren't slaves anymore. He said that's when the white men came into the community to do the plumbing work, to do the electrical work, to do the skill work. And that's how black women continue to be raped consistently, regularly, even after we were, quote, unquote, out of enslavement. Everything we need, we should know. And if we don't know it, then we need to get somebody to get that information and assist that person in getting it or those people in getting it. How do we forget that? Oh, that's right. We're being taken care of, so we don't have to worry about things anymore. Communalism requires nepotism. We already talked about communalism requires that we politically buy black. Why do I say politically buy black? I'm 190% behind the idea of buying black. My problem is that some of these people who we're buying black from because they happen to look like us, just like that race card thing. Some of these people have no loyalty whatsoever to African people and the money that we're giving to them, just like we're giving to everybody else who's in our community with stores is going out of the community as soon as we put it in their hands because they have no sense of loyalty. They're not committed to the empowerment of African people. They don't want to have anything to do with African people. Many of them are truly mentocidal. 
they hate themselves. But they know that they have a market in the black community now with this blah, blah, blah black thing. Just like so many of the faculty who I encountered at the two African HBCUs that I taught at. They didn't want to be there. They wanted to be at the real institutions. But because those real institutions wouldn't give them jobs, they were stuck at pretending that they wanted to be at these HBCUs. You want to know the politics of who you're buying from. You want to know their politics. You want to know their loyalty. Let's not stop at just buying black. Things are supposed to progress. Things are supposed to get better. We're supposed to be moving with this sovereign vision, this vision towards sovereignty. If that's the case, then we need to be improving. We need to not just get stuck in one place and just go with it. Our definitions need to become more refined. What did the ancestors say? The path of righteousness is narrow. The path of fools, traitors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is very wide. But if we're trying to move towards sovereignty, our path needs to be coming, becoming narrower and narrower, which means that we need to reach the point where there is no compromise. For those individuals, I don't, I don't care what color your skin is. I want to know what color your skin is and what color your mind is. This is a statement on trust that I normally say. Unity requires trust. There can be no community without trust any more than you can have civilization without interpersonal civility. We forget about it. We use words, and because they we've learned these words and this fits this or what have you, we use them without thinking. We don't we don't understand sidewalk means a walk on the side, overpass, underpass, street light. We don't think about compound words anymore. We don't think about their meaning because we just assume a certain definition, but our understanding where they came from and what they really mean. So a lot of stuff gets biased because we're not thinking, like critically thinking, which won't put you in this place where you're so stiff and walk around frowning and got books and you know you like the squares of the square. No. Can't watch any movies anymore. Can't do anything else because you're, you're you're so critical and you're thinking, no, it doesn't do that to you. That's the lie. Just like we got lied to when we were young about how history was boring. So you can't define civilization, something that's, that's being civilization, if there's no interpersonal civility. We don't live in a civilization. In a civilization, people act civilly toward each other. In a civilization, the children are cared for. In a civilization, you wouldn't have homeless children. I don't ever remember reading anywhere about African civilization having homeless children. And now John Henry Clark brought it to the point, there were no prisons in any African society. You can't be a civilization if you have children who are hungry, children who are homeless, children who are raped, children who are turned out on corners like the boys here in Atlanta. It's not a civilization. Now, it may be a society, because that's a more generic, general definition. But this is a civilization because we don't treat each other civilly. And as our ancestors defined being human, Europeans have defined human in such a way that they can be included, including all of the individuals who are part of them who act in an insane way, all their perverse perversities. So they still get able to, a serial killer remains a human. In our traditions, that a, a serial killer wouldn't be a human, even though I don't know of a record of a serial killer in traditional African society anywhere. And no, that's not to say that we're perfect, not going to go into that nonsense right there. But there was a major difference between us and them, especially in terms of the rules, the laws, and the practice of being of good character. read the teachings of Batahotep and compare it with Machiavelli's The Prince. That'll get you going. If there's no record of you being human, then you aren't human. You may be a living thing, being, whatever, but you're not human. Because being a human requires a certain kind of behavior over time. 
not just when you get in my face and you're smiling and now you're suddenly human, but everything that you've done up to this point has been to destroy me. You develop trust through taking chances. We, the best, I think that's probably the thing among us that is the worst. We, we don't trust each other. We take it to the next level. And that didn't come from us. That came from us being socialized to not trust each other. In many ways, in many ways, countless ways. But if you want to change something, this is like we had a, a student who wouldn't do her, wouldn't do her homework. And um, she, she was tired of all of the correctives here and tired of all the correctives at home. So she indicated that she wanted to change. She wanted to, you know, start being respected as a student, someone who wanted to learn. And she asked me, you know, well, how do you do that? And I said, well, you know, you got to stop the behavior. You got to start doing your, your homework. And so she started doing her homework. And she did her homework for like a week. And of course, we were happy and excited, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, now, now I'm back in good graces and, you know, everything. And I start pulling these A's, blah, blah, I said, you know, when you have taken an enormous amount of time to prove to people how undeserving, if you will, of a person you can be, you're going to have to prove that you're worth it for that same amount of time for them to trust that that is really what you're about. People have done this to us for generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. And all they got to do is smile, hold our hand, give us a hug, and everything is fine. As if they're not that. Only through the conscious, collective development of interpersonal trust. That means that we're doing it because we want to do it. We are willing this into existence. And we're doing this together. Let's say collective, I ain't talking about, I, I keep saying, I'm not talking about every African. Every African doesn't want to be African. Some Africans hate the idea of being African. Some Africans will sell their soul to be European or anything but African. I'm talking about those who want to be African, those who want African sovereignty. I'm not worried about anybody else. Too much time, too much energy for me to be involved in that. Only through the conscious, collective development of interpersonal trust can we evolve into thinking, selfless communities within that community, within that safe, sacred space, within that shrine that we're creating, progressively moving closer and closer toward a unified nation? How to build a moja at the level of race, nation. Again, to repeat, Mama Rumba, Pan-Africanist vision of African people throughout the world joining forces to fight for African sovereignty and constructing an African world order is our definition of Umoja. And I pretty much want to close. I think I do. Yep. You guys can't see that yet. With a definition of sovereignty, which I try to read out as much as, as often, because a lot of us are walking around with words on our tongues and we don't have a deep definition of what it means in terms of creating something African. We have been so destroyed, our definitions have been so limited, so convoluted, so twisted out of anything African and toward everything anybody else, especially European, that. Many of us can't even conceive of things in an ideal way that would be African. It's like a lot of us couldn't imagine a world without Europeans or Asians or Arabs. We, 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 we'd be lost. We'd spend the rest of our lifetimes trying to find one of them to, to love. Sovereignty, the successful outcome of any nationalist movement. And I took this book, took this definition from a book I wrote that was essentially about nationalism. Uh, that was a message to the warriors. Uh, but to me, 
the sovereignist movement is all about sovereignty. See, me, a nationalist movement is all about sovereignty. There's, there's, what other reason could there be to have a nationalist movement than sovereignty? I, I don't know of any other reason why you would do that. Because the nationalist movement is about building a nation. So the successful outcome of any nationalist movement is sovereignty for the people. It's only logical. That's common sense. Being sovereign means having absolute, underlined, italicized, bold, put in size 2,000 font, absolute control over the life of the nation. Life of the nation. Think very carefully about what's meant by the life of the nation. Not just talking about the people. Right now, as always, for African people, sovereignty is measured by how intelligently, independently, and powerfully we control, we control our resources, Story, culture, time, space, and destiny, and anything else that we feel belongs to us, or we feel will affect our thinking, or we feel that will determine our future in some way that doesn't benefit us. Our resources, our story. We work around pretending that we have power, but in Texas now, the textbooks in the school say that African people came here as immigrants looking for jobs. That's in the textbooks now. We're talking about, we got some control. How much control do we have when we see those blue lights flashing behind us? Because our response is very, very different than that. White folks who are driving see those blue lights flashing behind us. Pretenders. It is to have the power within the nation to control our lives, something that we have absolutely no control over here. We just hoping that we'll live. And to control them in our best interest, regardless of opposition from outside. That is a primary definition of power. Wade Nobles said it so beautifully. Regardless of opposition from outside, regardless of what other people want, that's their problem. They know better than to step in this direction because they know that we will come back at them will make them regret it. Accordingly, being sovereign has to mean that there is no one beyond us who makes any decisions about how we rule ourselves, how we live, what we believe, how we deal with enemies, whether aliens or traitors. And of course, the point needs to be brought out that we are the only people now who don't remove their traders from existence. And historically, that's always been the corrective. That's always been the punishment for a traitor. You are giving enemies secrets about your people so that they can kill you? And how we visualize our future and communicate and express that vision Nobody's supposed to interfere or have any say about how we say, how we define sovereignty. No one should have any say about how we define that. And they should know you don't go and bomb the house of the person who defined it correctly because you don't like the way it says. Or you might end up with half of your city missing. That's the level that you have to be thinking about if you are visualizing sovereignty. I don't mean you go out and blow up the city, but you understand the point of the magnitude of the fear that other people should have relative to trying to interfere with us speaking our words. It means that we are completely and consciously self-defining. We don't go look into other people's words to see what we're supposed to be about or who we are or the Negroes and lost souls who speak for other people who introduce confusion into our community intentionally to keep us off balance in service to Urugu.
self-defining, self-determining, and self-empowered. And since no nation has ever risen to power and stayed there without holding their own tradition sacred, show me one. Show me one who has risen to power and stayed there without holding on to their, their traditions. The most important one. They don't throw away their past. They don't run to somebody else to find out who they are. What did the proverb say? If you're looking for, if something has been lost, then you look at home first. Sovereignty necessarily means that we know, respect, protect, and extend in time through every coming generation who we are as a direct reflection of our ancestors. Sovereignty is our ultimate goal. And it's our job to pass that on in the family and in the community and in the nation. And if those we attempt to pass it on in the family, when they grow up, they decide that they don't want to be us. That's not our concern. We did our work. We did our work. Lucia has a beautiful statement in there about your children if they turn against you and what you have taught them. To those who don't know, that's Mount Kilimanjaro. And it's one of our esteemed Babas in Atlanta here and said, that's supposed to be our mouth. That's the one we're reaching for. Sovereignty is the highest form of unity because then you have a nation. Then you have a nation. Now I'm gonna recommend these three really based upon the things that I've talked about. The middle one deals with character. Let's take it from our tradition. Take it from understanding what we're supposed to be about. I pull from all over the place. To have a collection of the ideas that come from our ancestors in terms of being African, as well as being African within this particular reality that is anti-African. We want to build community. That's what Centered is about, building African realities. Common sense security, I think all warriors need to have read that. Everybody in our community needs to read that. And it's, it's easy reading. Each chapter is maybe a page, page and a half. Some of, well, some of them are three or four or five, but it's about protecting ourselves. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that, we're easy pickings. Easy pickings, because we're not using our common sense. We're not incorporating the security as a second nature, so we don't have to worry about it. We just automatically just do. So Madasi P, I appreciate very much you allowing me to share this space with you, for allowing me to say things I think that need to be said to us on the first day of Kwanzaa, so that we can move through the rest of them correctly framework of unity. I appreciate you all being here. I'm honored that I was asked. Now, BB for ODA. I see two young men who I know. Good to see you too. Ah, oh, Richard Raw. Yes, sir. How you doing? There she is.
Okay. Baba Kazimde? Um, I'm gone. Everybody take care. Enjoy. Please support Black Dot. Oh, I can't go yet. The find is earth. So I hope that you saw the picture of the family. I got to go back. I got to brag a little bit for a second. Do work, do work for the community. Pull out those models that you need to see. There we go, right in the middle. That's a beautiful, those are three beautiful families. All right, seriously. <laughs> I've got people. Take care, everybody. BB for Hodier.